flying over YouTube City, Free Speech Mouse surveys the landscape, looking for censorious activity. Accompanied by Sinfold, the world's most simple sycophant. Hey, Chief! We haven't run into a lot of censors lately, have we? Not really, Sinfold. I suppose we're all just giving in to my obvious rampant genius. Oh, yes! Oh, say, isn't that a censor down there? Why, it's really Sinfold! Prepare for landing! What's your problem here, kid? You got hyperactivity deficit disorder combined with nothing better to do? You're the one with the problem! You're suppressing my right to free speech! What? Do you even know what free speech is? Sure! It's the right to say what I want, where I want, anytime I want, so that too! Kid, let me tell you something. You chose the wrong person to try to buffalo about so-called free speech and censorship. Censorship, intellectual freedom, that's right in line with my professional training. You and all your crybaby friends out there haven't got the brains God gave an anteater when it comes to this subject. Chief, I understand. He just doesn't see how brilliant you are. Uh, okay, let's put this to rest. To discuss the meaning of censorship, and why what we do here on YouTube with comments isn't, we need to start with some background about libraries. Libraries come in many different flavors. Most of us are familiar with our local public libraries, and many of us are aware of school or academic libraries. But there's another more obscure type which goes under a broad umbrella category called a special library. This type of library is devoted to a highly specific purpose or community, such as a hospital medical library or a law firm's law library. Most of the time, not always, a special library is privately owned, but can also be part of a public institution while being devoted to a specific topic. A public library serves a particular wide-ranging clientele namely the residents of a given geographic area like a county or a city. It's funded by the residents through taxes, it's assigned to serve as a resource for informational and recreational materials, and so of course it has a wide range of materials from works of fiction to works of philosophy to newspapers, magazines, CDs, DVDs, and whatever else the residents might want. In contrast, a special library serves both a particular narrow purpose and a particular narrow clientele. A law firm's law library, for example, would be intended only to serve lawyers of the firm that it belongs to, or people doing serious legal research, and would only be expected to have books and other materials related to law. Next, we need to discuss two important concepts in library science, censorship versus selection. Let's start with the public library. And for the purposes of discussion, we'll use a book that's often a target for censorship, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. This is Gwen, the public librarian. She's trying to decide whether to add Catcher in Rye to the collection. And in the end, she decides not to. From a distance, censorship and selection don't look any different because in both cases, she doesn't order the book. So how do we tell the difference? With censorship, the main reason she doesn't order it would be because it offends her, or because she's afraid it will offend some of the library users. That's considered censorship in good measure because as a public librarian, she's supposed to serve the needs and desires of all her patrons, which would include people who want to read Catcher in the Rye. 
and she's not supposed to do that at the behest of those who are offended by it, because she serves all those patrons equally. In contrast, what would be a cause for not buying Catcher in the Rye if it was a selection issue? This could be any number of reasons. One could be that the library already has 20 copies of it and doesn't need any more. Another could be that the library's budget can't afford too many books and she has to pick the ones more likely to be read. Which means, uh, this might get chosen for purchase before Salinger does. No kidding. Either way, a selection choice mostly has to do with more practical factors, some of them beyond Gwen's control. Now what about a special library? Here's Sam the special librarian to demonstrate. And just for example, let's say he runs a medical library in a hospital. Now obviously there'd never be any issue over whether or not to include Catcher in the Rye in the collection, because it doesn't belong in a medical library. The only special library it would belong in would be, say, a library devoted to the works of mid-20th century American authors. In a medical library, though, it doesn't serve the needs of that library's clientele. Now it's time to ask a question. Which of these two types of libraries is most like someone's YouTube channel? That's right, it's more like a special library. Unlike a public library, a YouTube channel doesn't serve a wide-ranging clientele, unless it's an accessory of something like a public library, or a government office. It's also not funded by its clientele through taxes or any other tangible support. Like a special library, though, it's usually meant to serve both a particular narrow purpose and a particular narrow clientele. Here, for example, we intend only to serve those interested in biblical apologetics. And as I've stated, this channel is mainly a demonstration project. So what's this all mean? Obviously, it means that I or any other channel owner has every right to choose what gets to be on it. That's something YouTube itself clearly recognizes when they provide the ability to control things like ratings and comments. In turn, this means that we too can actually practice censorship. What we do is equivalent to selection, or as it is more often called in the online world, moderation. To accuse someone of censorship here because they moderate comments or delete them is, as we already know, asinine and childish. But it's also a blatant misuse of the word censorship. The reality is, moderation isn't censorship, and that's just too bad for the crybabies. It can't be called censorship just because they don't like it. To whine about that is to declare that their own desires or preferences are more important than that of the channel owner or his target clientele. And that's not exercising free speech. That's being arrogant and obnoxious. Earlier I issued a challenge to the censorship crybabies to put their money where their mouth was, and each one of them proved their lack of principle by ignoring it. Now let's give them another one. Our point about censorship can be proven even further when we consider definitions of censorship by specialists concerned with the issue. Now, if you read this carefully, you notice that none of this sounds like what we do here on YouTube, or what happens on forums and blogs. Like we've always said here, we're not the government, and YouTube is not a public institution. A user's YouTube channel is also not a media outlet in exclusive terms. 
YouTube itself is a media outlet, which means that censorship could only possibly occur if YouTube itself is the one acting on the material. Note that moderation doesn't mean that no one has the chance to read or view something, or that you can't say or think a certain thing, because the crybabies can just repost whatever they want on their channel or on someone else's. And that's another analogy that needs to be emphasized. When a book publisher rejects a manuscript, that isn't censorship. Comments on YouTube are analogous to someone submitting a book to a publisher, that is, a channel owner, hoping it would be published. But just as the publisher can reject a manuscript as not suitable for their publishing mission, so likewise a YouTube channel owner can reject a comment as not suitable for their channel's mission. And there's another key distinction the crybabies ignore. With a censor, material is created, and the censor attacks it after the fact. But an editor and a moderator sets rules for participation in content prior to the submission of material. In other words, your participation in an editor or moderator's domain implies a free and willing decision on your part to abide by the rules and guidelines they set out, whereas a censor imposes their own rules from the outside on those who made no agreement with them. And consider this, those who join a moderated community have done so with their own consent to the rules of moderation. The censorship crybaby is someone who essentially tells the whole community, screw your rules, do what I want you to do. In some cases, these crybabies are merely disruptive individuals who end up interrupting or discouraging free communication. In some cases, they can even cause people to want to leave an unmoderated channel. Hmm. An outsider who tries to impose his own rules, disrupts or discourages free communication, causes others to not have the chance to express their point of view, sounds like a censor. These guys are the very thing they claim to hate most. But that leads to this other challenge I have for censorship crybabies. If you travel around the internet, you'll find there's a whole lot of places where comments are moderated to varying degrees of strictness, ranging from blogs to YouTube channels to forums. This is obviously very widespread, but if you're a crybaby who thinks that censorship, here's what you can do. Here's contact information for two of those major organizations we referred to. They make fighting censorship their main mission. How about you crybabies give one or both of them a call or drop them a line? Let them know there's a big problem with censorship out there that they're missing. Because when you look at their websites, there's plenty of examples of them going after public or school libraries or government bodies engaged in what they regard as censorship. But, for some reason, they don't have a single example of a privately held or operated blog, forum, or YouTube channel on there. Hmm. Wonder how they're missing all that. Maybe you crybabies aren't crying loud enough. And now we'll close out this vid with some remarks to this particular crybaby.
That'll be all for now, except for one thing. It's pretty clear that a censorship crybaby is someone who isn't competent to address a real argument. So, we'll have one more surprise for them. Soon. See you then.